Hi there, and welcome to this episode of In Conversation. My name is Nikki Dean. I am the editorial director for Earth, Environment and Social Science Nature Journals here at Spring and Nature. And today I'm very excited to be talking with Lord Deben. Um, Lord Deben is the former chair of the UK's um, Climate Change Committee. And prior to that, he was Secretary of State for the Environment between 1993 and 97. And he's also been the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. And I'm very excited to be talking with him today about uh, how we deal with uh, issues to do with climate change, sustainability and the research policy interface. Uh, Lord Deben, um, researchers and uh, many civil society actors and other types of activists have been calling for rapid action on climate change for many decades now. Um, how do, in your experience, um, policymakers think about academic research when uh, developing policy or as a means to informing policy? And in your experience uh, working in government, but perhaps also working as part of the CCC, how do you, what do you think has worked particularly well or, or maybe less well? And in summary. Well, I think it depends where in the process this is. I mean, right at the beginning, as people became more and more clear that climate change was uh, really happening, of course, it was very inconvenient. Uh, that uh, film, The Inconvenient Truth, is absolutely right. I mean, that Al Gore was correct in choosing that title. It was very inconvenient. And so what happens to human beings when they think something's inconvenient is that they decide that it isn't true. And that's exactly what happened to start with. So there was a real issue about that. Uh, in Britain, we were fortunate because Mrs. Thatcher, leader of the right of centre party, and herself clearly on the right of that party to many in, in many ways, um, was a scientist. And therefore, she accepted the truth of the academics. And it was the academics that convinced her. So one does have to say academia had a really direct effect. Uh, and I, at the time, was uh, writing many of her speeches and, and therefore we worked very closely together on those speeches and the things that Matt had said. I know perfectly well why it was that she did that. <clears throat> but I don't think there were many of us who were in the government who actually thought that at the time. But because she was Prime Minister and because people trusted her, uh, she, of course, went to Rio and made the Rio um, conference a reality by herself getting um, uh, uh, the American president to go. I mean, uh, George Bush went because of her. And then uh, afterwards, she addressed the United Nations and said, we really do have to do something about this together because it is really serious. So I think in that sense, um, what happened at the time were those two different things. Somebody who was a scientist, recognising the science and taking action. Uh, other people who weren't scientists, listening to the science and saying, well, I don't like that very much. It would be rather better if that weren't true, so I'm not going to believe it. And um, therefore, we went then through a long period of time while people tried to get to terms with it. So you then got uh, a period in time in which academics were being suborned uh, actually to suggest, well, it wasn't quite as uh, sure as one thought. Now, some of those were real, but, but an awful lot of it was put together uh, so that uh, uh, great companies were able to say, well, there's this uh, research going on in this university or this kind of research to look and see whether it's something to do with something quite different without admitting that that research was there because they were paying for it. They were asking a question which was a means of making academia look as if there were possibilities which were different. And uh, then, of course, there was a real attack on academia so that you had uh, uh, people who were being cancelled, in effect, because they were standing up for what was right. And, of course, they played into that particular American interest, which is that somehow or other... People don't like experts. And, and there's a, a long anti tradition of anti-intellectualism in the United States, and that was played into very considerably. But I think gradually what happened then was that it became more and more clear that this was what was true. And it engaged other people who were, in a sense, better um, uh, at explaining this to the public. 
um, than the uh, academics themselves. So you began to get people culminating, of course, in the Pope. When, when, if you read Laudato Si, it's absolutely filled with the um, findings of academia. That's that's what it is. Um, and uh, Laudato Deum, which is his uh, follow-up letter, which was six mu- uh, six weeks or two months ago, um, is again uh, using the science. But he is a better producer of that. And first of all, he writes so much better than many scientists, but also he's a better, it's in the context of saying, this is why this is true and why we have to do something about it. Now, he's one. There are lots of other people who have popularized the science um, and uh, countered those who have tried to undermine them. Mm-hmm. So where we are today, I guess we find ourselves, a, you know, we're seeing particularly in the last year or two, more and more evidence, of course, in our everyday lives of the impacts, the reality of climate change, right? We had the hottest summers on record now here in the in the UK and parts of Europe, uh, these last two years, increased, so increased heat, increased cold, droughts, uh, you know, tropical storms. I think people are really seeing more and more in their lives, right, the, the actual effects of this. Um, as you say, there had been a big push. Uh, there's been a more of an under, global understanding amongst leaders about things to do. But perhaps, and and I think it's probably fair to say you've been a bit of a critic of this yourself in 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 recent times. I mean, there 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 remains this gulf, perhaps perhaps even more so than ever now, between the per- the perception that the public have on the need to act and the way that these things this is beginning to bite at home, and the action they see government taking. Um, and 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 you know. Do, I mean, how do we how do we move that? How do we reconcile that gap in your view? Well, you're right that um, people are much more aware of uh, climate change today than they were, and that's why I remind politicians that it's going to get worse every year. Um, even if we do everything we should do uh, for the next twenty years, we've got to realise it'll get worse every year. So if you don't catch into it now, the fact is people will blame you very soon because. Uh, uh, flooding is all very well if it happens somewhere else, but when it's your for home that's flooded, the the world is different. I I live in a village which uh, much of which was flooded just recently, and uh, the effect upon people was very serious indeed, and they do recognise that, and so they are asking the government, what is it doing about adaptation? But beyond that, they begin to ask, well, if it's going to go on like this, what? What are we doing in mitigation? What are we doing that much further? That's what people begin to ask. But of course, politicians are constantly affected by the shortness of election periods. And what we've got in Britain at this moment is a a government which is thrashing about to try to find something that it can put forward as showing that it is in somehow more moderate, more reasonable than its opponents. And it's decided that it, it ought to pretend that its opponents want to do extreme things about climate change because they've got a hang up about it. Whereas they, who are very keen on dealing with climate change, would have done it in a way which doesn't upset anybody. Well, this isn't, of course, true. The point is that the opposition has its own problems because when it very rightly said that you really cannot uh, uh, produce uh, a program of... uh, of exploitation uh, and indeed uh, looking for more oil in the North Sea right into the 2030s because the, we're going to be awash with oil in the 2030s because the world is going to move, as the International Energy Authority says, we're moving away so fast from fossil fuels that that we'll have oil being produced all over the world, which we can get. It removes your opportunity to try to help developing countries, for example, who are being suborned by uh, some of the larger, and I'm afraid to say, American oil companies to, 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 to move from where they are to what they are talking about, the clean gas. Gas isn't clean. It happens to be cleaner than the dirtiest ways of producing this, but that's all. So they want that, of course, because they can sell gas, whereas where we really want them to move is to wind and solar, which is very much cheaper and very much better for them uh, in every sense. So that is exactly what we need to do. And you can't ask them to do that if you're investing in more oil in the North Sea, which is why that was a huge mistake. 
the, the, it isn't British oil. It'll be sold on the international market, and it will be sold at a price which will, I am afraid to say, be very low and will not be very sensible to invest in. So uh, what we have to do is to get the argument straight and talk much more clearly to people in language they understand, which is why when I was um, say, uh, the head of the Climate Change Committee, I, I banned the phrase kilowatt hour because I don't think anybody knows what a kilowatt hour is. I don't. They have to keep on reminding me what it means. But I do know what it means if my bill goes up by 10% or down by 10%. I do understand my bill, and that yes. is true of everybody. And so that's the language we should use. It's it's an interesting point. I mean, so, so coming, uh, having spent time working uh, on nature energy and, and working with the energy community, I mean, I very much recognize this, right? And I think that that, act, that community, particularly in the... Uh, the amongst the the economists and a lot of the social scientists and the engineers recognize this challenge to an extent, yeah. right? And have increasingly begin to seek ways to translate what they do. And is there also a critical role for some other kinds of bodies maybe that can specialize more in that intermediate uh, space in, in bringing the public along with us and then by extension, bringing politicians, parliamentarians and similar kind of decision-making bodies because you can start to really uh, translate what what the, what the research is telling us. Well, you must find that in your own work, that you're talking to different audiences, and you have to do that in a different way. I mean, much of what nature does is talking to people who understand these things, and you're not going to talk to them in other than the language which they use. But a much of the rest that it does is to reach out to a wider audience, and you talk differently when you're talking to them. Very and, much. I mean, I take a particular example. I've always found when talking to the sort of audience which might be questioning a rather right-wing audience, that you should start with gardening. And you start off by saying to them, you will remember, looking around the audience if they're of a particular age, you will remember that when you started gardening, gardening spring came much, much later. And therefore, you found that the pollinators came out at the same time as the blossoms. Spring now comes 17 days earlier than it did when I started gardening. Um, and the pollinators don't come out until much later. So the blossoms and the pollinators are now disconnected. So this is a symbol of what we're doing to the world. We're, we're upsetting the fundamental mechanisms by which we live and by which the world sustains us and why the how the planet actually works. And when they face up to that, then you do enable their thoughts to move from the immediate to being prepared to take tough measures, particularly if you point out that if in their lifetime it's come 17 days earlier, just think of what will happen to their grandchildren. And that seems to me to be the way in which you try to talk about these things because they're within the context and the experience of people and they begin to be prepared to take measures, tougher measures. Now, what has happened up to now is that the big changes, the reductions in emissions, which we are constantly being told about, they've all been done without anybody taking any notice of it. It's been done by the way in which we have changed the generating system. And people don't really connect with that. We now have to do a lot of other things which are going to affect the way in which people live. And so to tell the world that you could reach net zero without inconveniencing anybody is just not true. No, of course. You've got to do something different. You've got to explain to people that we are doing this because the alternative is very much more expensive, very much more dangerous, and isn't just to protect their children and grandchildren, but to protect them. I, I think that if you do it in that way, governments have got to become much more willing to take the community with them, but to be truthful about it. We're, we're a nation for, for, for which fairness is very important, and I believe that a just transition, a fair transition, is crucially important, and we have to show people all the way along the line that that's what we're doing. So we ought to take those kind of decisions. That's why I'm in favour of a really hefty tax 
on uh, private airplanes. Uh, every flight ought to cost people the cost of the damage they do to the environment. And then I want that money hypothecated. I know the Treasury hates hypothecation, but hypothecated, for example, to taking the VAT off the energy that you use in uh, an EV if you take it on the public sector. I mean, it's quite wrong. But because I'm lucky enough to have a drive, I pay 8% um, VAT. Whereas if I put it in the road, I pay 20% VAT. So you do the things as far as you can, which show that you are being fair, that the people who can most afford it and who are causing most of the energy uh, misuse um, pay for it. And then you do still have to say to people, but there are things which we're going to have to do, which you may not like. And one of the things we're going to have to do is that we're going to have to insist that equipment is very much more uh, uh, energy efficient. Uh, that may mean that to start with some of it's more expensive. And, and I'm afraid that's one of the things we have to do. There are a whole series of things. But of course, they're always frightened by sort of yes. extreme things, which nobody is suggesting. No, of course, and it's a, it's a transition, right? We are we're all on a journey, yeah. and different things will move at different speeds. But you 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 raise an interesting point there, which is the move, I guess, from you know it's establishing a science base and pointing to the, these impacts and what will happen into the future, but then also thinking about um, solutions. And there there is an enormous and ever growing body of um, proposals within the academic literature. Um, to to find solutions. So examples around uh, tailpipe emissions and EV deployment, to touch on what you just talked about, are among them. And um, you know, there are all kinds of ways to think about taxation and carbon pricing and when do we deploy which technology. Well, we might bring something in and it's expensive, but we also understand actually quite well the dynamics of how prices can change and so how that might alter. Now, we have a lot of research on this, and a, a lot yeah. of researchers who desperately want to be able to communicate this to, uh, to, to policy makers, to decision makers and the like. Um, and, and they perhaps struggle with this. And some of this might be what we talked about, that you know, the, their ability to communicate in plain language you know, may, may not be uh, what's needed. But do you think there's, there are other gaps at that, at that interface, at that, that policy research interface, where we clearly have big you know, there's a big ask within government about how do I do this? Do you, what's been your experience of that? And what, what do you think we can do that eases that interface? Well, I think there is a problem with our press in the sense that uh, many of these um, futuristic steps, many of these ideas uh, ought to be making the newspapers, but we do have newspapers overwhelmingly dominated by those who do not actually accept the urgency of climate change. You know, that these, these newspapers get it wrong, and they get it wrong for particular reasons. They get it wrong because it's inconvenient for the moment, and the newspaper of all things is a daily operation. Next day it wraps in the, the fish and chips, and that's the truth. Sure, and therefore you you are. It's very difficult to get a newspaper in any case to take a longer term view, and the trouble with those that do take a longer term view is that they tend also then to become um, lacking in any kind of judgment and balance. And and I mean, I a Guardian reader for many years, but I have to say the fact that it really can't joke. So if you take um, the newspapers, that's very difficult because of their short time interest. The second um, area, which I do think we've got to be better at, I mean, the podcasts are working quite well, um, and the fact that people will listen to it, but it is a particular group of people, one has to accept, that, that talk about that. And we've got to be better at social media. Um, social media is with us and, and has huge disadvantages, but it does have a real advantage. And one of the things I think the government has done rightly is to try to interrupt the constant flow of um, absolutely untruthful stuff. It seems to me that one of the things we've got to do is to do what the early freedom uh, of newspapers did. 
when they first got rid of censorship, they insisted that every newspaper said who the publisher was. I gave a proper address. I do think we've got to get to a stage in which the internet is, yes, free, and of course people can say what they like to most extent, but I do want to know who they are. But otherwise, you, you can't decide whether the truth could possibly rely there. They're, so they right. must say who they are, who pays for them, um, and what they're, uh, and you must be able to look up what their connections are. The fact is, part of in part of having a grown-up society is allowing people to have information. That's the argument in favour of the internet. But that argument only works if you know also who is giving that information, from what point they are doing it. No, I think you make some very valid points and this idea around public communication remains very critical, right? And I think is a, is a valuable role for, for, for um, the media, for social media, for, for publishers as well, like us. I guess one thing I'm also a little bit curious about um, is, is where we're trying to communicate maybe to specific groups. And if we think again, like researchers trying to connect their research to parliamentarians to talk to specific policy uh, issues that is then not necessarily in a public um, fully public domain uh, you know it might not be a call for evidence but they're, they're, they're seeking to, to have this influence um, where there are different communication channels where where maybe there might be gaps there that that can help researchers think about overcoming some of these blocks and helping with solutions you know more that so more than just like the the idea of public communication but actually how do how do researchers within their and 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 maybe this this is also a bit of a question about incentives in on both sides of the this this academic policy divide maybe it's also something for universities and funders to think about but how we can we can motivate very solution oriented work getting across that gap into the hands of people that need it be that civil servants or, or policy makers, or even people in independent units like the, climate, the Committee on Climate Change? Well, I think it's uh, difficult because um, many of the people whom you want to hear about this are the least easy to get to hear about it. And indeed, many of them are in that position because there is so much out there which is uh, uh, addressing them. Uh, which is what I think is one of the biggest problems that we have. So one just has to work hard in, in various different ways. And you're right, there are specialist issues. Well, that may mean specialist uh, avenues like your own magazines. It may be um, reaching out through uh, specialists in government and the so-called special advisors. One of the problems is that they've become political advisors. They haven't, they've ceased. When I was a Secretary of State, I had, uh, I had four special advisors, of whom three were um, not political at all. I had so an advisor on biodiversity, an advisor on architecture, um, and an advisor on more general environmental things. None of them were elect put there because they were of political kind. I had one advisor on local government who was political because that was the nature of local governments. But nowadays, there are very few of that kind. And, and I think this is a real issue. And one has to use entry into ministries through the uh, science director, whoever it happens to be. That, that there are ways of doing it. And I think sometimes um, the researchers are at fault because they haven't bothered to do some of the work you need to do in order to do the communication bit. They sort of feel like, I produced the work, and you know, it's, it's, it's quite understandable, but that's that's one of the things yes. we have to do. And we also have to um, use all sorts of other things. The Royal Society has uh, regular lectures, which lots of politicians go to. There are all kinds of uh, organisations, everything from you know the Conservative Environmental Network to um, all sorts of ways in which you can get into... Uh, politicians and uh, political people and and that we have got to be better at using if i can ask one last question about uh communication which i think has been a, a, a very clear theme here it's we've talked a lot about um uh the impacts of climate change mitigation adaptation and the like 
Um, you, uh, but you mentioned this a little bit, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on what the importance for us in trying to also communicate all of these other co-benefits that come with yep. tackling climate change, right? Like we, we, ULES is an example that's really more of an air quality yes. policy in many ways. Um, we have development questions um, if we look at um, parts of the global south, for example. So are we missing a trick here in not also folding in all of these myriad co-benefits that can improve our, our lives, our health, our livelihoods, you know, as part of bringing people along with the change that's needed. Yes, and um, and indeed, I have a fundamental problem, for example, with Greenpeace, which I've always thought uh, make the whole business miserable. You know, it's a sort of moral crusade about, uh, and and in a sense, you feel they think we'd be better off rather colder and travelling less. Um, this is unfair, but this is what actually comes across. I think that the whole point about climate change is that we should be saying to people, um, this may be the spur, but the world which we are seeking to build is a much better world than the one that we have at the moment. That it, it's a cleaner world. It's um, a warmer world. It's a world which I mean, warmer in the sense that we have homes which are actually uh, a better place for dealing with cold weather. It's a world in which um, we take a great deal more interest in our neighbours because this is something we have to do together. It's a world which uh, should be very much better for our children and grandchildren. And I'm excited by the changes that in the end we're going to make. Um, and we should put it forward as this kind of change. And secondly, we should say, if we're talking about the cost of living crisis, reducing the cost of energy means moving faster towards renewables, which are the cheapest form of energy production. If we use less energy, it's cheaper for people. We can use the changes we want to make to help the poorest most. All those things are co-benefits, and we ought to talk about them in that way. But above all, we ought to be talking about it in that way of saying this is a better world, which is really why um, Laudato Si and the Pope's words are so valuable, because it's, a, it's filled with joy. It's filled with saying this is a better world that we are building, and the world that we are leaving behind has got so many things about it which are unacceptable, and that is why we should be making these changes. Well, you know, I think that's a really wonderful place to leave it on such a kind of optimistic, joyful outlook. So uh, I think at this point, I just want to thank you very much, Lord Deben, for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I hope we can talk again another time. Thank you very I much. Thank you.